hypersonic missiles are proliferating. In the last several years, Russia added its Zircon missile and China added two or possibly three such system types to their inventories. Vice Admiral John Hale, who leads the US Missile Defense Agency, earlier this year said that the SM-6 missile is currently the only US defense against hypersonic weapons. He then added that even the SM-6 had only nascent capabilities against such weapons. Given that the US also has the Aegis BMD and THAAD systems, how can that be? The current US anti-missile systems are trying to adapt, but are they adapting quickly enough? This video will explain it all. But first, let's see what can be done on the ground in Crossout, our sponsor's game. It's an online vehicle shooter where you build your own combat vehicle from scratch. There's a bunch of structure elements to choose from, and the weapons. You can add cannons, lasers, rocket boosters, the list just goes on and on. Anti-grav devices are really cool. You'll be ready for battle in no time, as the building process is fun and easy. You can go solo or team up with your friends. There's a whole load of different mode games available, as well as 9 factions with distinct equipment to choose from. The only limit is your creativity, as they keep adding new features. You can play Crossout for free on PC, Xbox X and S and PS5. Follow the link or click below the video to download the game and get your exclusive free bonus. The unique pixel paint, a choice between a selection of three weapons and a powerful vehicle cabin. See you in battle! Back to our video. Vice Admiral Hill further stated that the issue is not so much seeing or tracking them, but in trying to destroy those threats, the SM-6 missiles are quote, the only option, however limited, end quote. But what are hypersonic missiles in general? At the most basic level, which pretty one no one is really using today, it's any missile that goes over Mach 5. Well, even ballistic missiles in World War II could briefly hit those speeds. Russian Iskander ballistic missile also goes hypersonic during a good deal of its flight. Even bigger ballistic missiles are easily hitting Mach 10 or even Mach 20. So when the military talks about hypersonic missiles today, they don't mean just the speed. It's speed coupled with maneuvers. The main distinguishing feature is the ability to radically shape its trajectory during its entire flight. And how do US anti-missile systems work? Today there is two main classes. Ones that are designed to intercept missiles while they're high up, before they close up on the target, and ones that try to intercept missiles in the very last stage of their flight. All anti-ballistic missile defense systems first detect a possible missile launch that can be done with outside sensors, like satellites looking for infrared signatures of large rocket motors. It could be done with their own radars or with third-party radars. Usually such radars are in fact very large ground-based radars. Due to their location and focus area, some are good only against very large intercontinental range ballistic missiles. Such radars are on fixed sites. They can observe only predetermined swaths of sky. The US has several such sites, but for example Japan also has quite a few, which would be more useful against tactical hypersonic missiles. Taiwan too has one such location. Sheer number of such locations can mean it's hard for the enemy to do a surprise attack from an unwanted direction, but the radars themselves are very vulnerable, as their location is fixed. So even more crucial are relocatable or mobile radars. Patriot system radar is capable enough to track large MLR rockets or small ballistic missiles. But hypersonic speed targets are really outside the scope of its design. THAAD's TPY-2 huge radar array comes on a large trailer. It takes longer to relocate and, as the radar is emitting, the enemy electronic emission gathering platforms may pinpoint its location fairly quickly. TPY radars will be added to Aegis Ashore sites, as complementary radars. Aegis Ashore is basically the same system as used on US ships, but operating from a building. But perhaps more important to US defenses is precisely the fleet of ships equipped with Aegis ballistic missile defense radars. Not all Aegis ships have said capability, however. Currently, some 48 US ships have been modernized to be BMD capable. Japan, for example, also has 8 of their ships equipped with the BMD Aegis. Now, ship-based defenses are quite a bit harder to get destroyed themselves in some sort of preemptive strikes. Even when its radars are emitting, the ship itself is moving. So the actual kill chain is more complicated and requires a constant third-party aerial platform 
to verify the location of the ship. As hypersonic missiles fly lower than ballistic missiles, any radar will generally spot them later, thus compromising possible interception. But here's the real problem. While both THAADS and Aegis's radars can track hypersonic missiles, they don't really have an effective way of intercepting them. THAAD missile has a large booster and an aerodynamically shaped kill vehicle, basically a spike with no explosive designed to ram into the target. It relies solely on the momentum given by the booster. Its steerable liquid fuel rocket thruster is there mostly to, well, steer. The lower the altitude is when trying to steer, where the air is denser, the quicker would the whole vehicle lose speed. Aegis's SM-3 missiles are more capable against very high flying ballistic missiles than thought. They have three stages, with the final stage being a kill vehicle designed to operate solely in outer space. It's great against outer space targets like even ICBMs at certain portions of their trajectory, but it literally makes it unable to engage today's hypersonic missiles which fly at lower altitudes. The recent Russian Kinzhal missile is a borderline modern hypersonic weapon. It's basically an Iskander ballistic missile layout adapted to be launched by an aircraft. Sure, it can maneuver to a degree, but not really more than the Iskander. It is, however, designed to fly a quite depressed trajectory, allegedly not going over 50 or 60 kilometers high up. For the regular Iskander, that's a factor that limits its horizontal reach. But for Kinzhal, which has the airplane serving as a booster, it's less of an issue. Still, existing systems such as THAAD, SM-6 and even Patriot's MSE missiles should be able to have some chance of intercepting it. Cruise missiles can also be hypersonic. Example would be the Russian Sirkan, and possibly the Chinese DF-100, but while possibly hypersonic, if DF-100 is indeed powered by a ramjet engine, it's likely only marginally hypersonic and flying at lower altitudes. The Russian Sirkan is powered by a scramjet engine, making it more dangerous. Sirkan is however only entering service. According to Russian officials, naval ships will be equipped with it in the fall of 2022. The land-launched variant is yet to come. Actual available numbers are likely quite low. But how do hypersonic cruise missiles work? They can fly a low-altitude trajectory, much like subsonic cruise missiles. While their range would be easily half that way, they might still be useful. For example, US Cold War Pluto II project envisioned a ramjet cruise missile flying at 1000 feet or less, while maintaining a speed of Mach 3.5, so the DF-100 would likely be able to do the same. Of course, the missile would not really be doing hypersonic speeds then, but it would still be dangerous. A thousand feet altitude means that most air defense radars would see the target just 9 or 12 miles away. There are many variables involved, biggest of which is location of the radar in relation to the location of the target. If the radar happens to be next to the location that's under threat, which won't be often, that would leave some 15 or so seconds for interception. If it's just a few miles away to the side, additional time would be wasted on the interceptor missile even reaching it. Even the US can't afford to have a destroyer parked or a Patriot battery parked near every important target. The destroyers would be especially hindered if used defensively like that, as then the US Navy would have little way of projecting power in other domains, fighting enemy ships or submarines. The issue is also that reaching such low-flying targets means the interceptor missiles can't fly fast as the density of air slows them down. So the current generation Aegis's SM-6 and to an extent even the Patriot's MSE missile would still struggle. The SM-6 would possibly remain around Mach 2 at low altitude, meaning that in a number of situations the interceptor launcher would have to be very close to the target it's protecting. Sircon allegedly also has a semi-ballistic trajectory mode, and it's plausible that the highest speed and longest range is applicable to such a mode but using such a semi-ballistic trajectory might be more prone to interceptions. It doesn't use the best feature of a hypersonic cruise missile. It's plausible that the Sircon missile could still fly around Mach 6 or so at an altitude just outside the reach of air defense missiles that use fins to steer through the atmosphere, yet low enough so even THAAD and let alone SM-3 can't use their kill vehicles against it. That may be around 30 or 40 kilometers up, as scramjet engines scale well with altitude. Ramjet engines, on the other hand, are unlikely to operate beyond 30 km in altitude. Crucially, Sircon retains the ability to turn and fly circles if needed. Even at just 30 km up, 
air defense missiles like the SM-6 are less responsive and less maneuverable, adding more uncertainty to the interception. At 40 kilometers up, they basically can't maneuver anymore. THAAD is able to do some intercepts within the atmosphere, but judging from this Missile Defense Agency graphic, it's plausible that the very low altitude interceptions, say below 40 kilometers, may not be effective. That would very much explain the statements from Vice Admiral John Hill, and he is not alone in his assessment. Michael Griffin echoed those statements, saying, quote, The United States will not have a defensive capability against hypersonic weapons until the mid-2020s, at the earliest. End quote. It's possible, however, that both officials were referring more to hypersonic gliders, rather than cruise missiles. Gliders may be even more dangerous. Russia has a strategic-class hypersonic glider, the Avangard, launched by ICBMs. It too would be very hard to intercept, but we'll focus on tactical weapons in this video. China has two such weapons, the DF-17, in use for a few years now, and the mystery missile dubbed the DF-27, which is so new that its operational status may still be marginal. Both use the same principle. They rely on a ballistic missile to get them high up and very fast. Once the missile is in its mid-course phase, the front section, the glider warhead, detaches. The glider, due to its wing-like body shape and control surfaces, basically skids over the very thin atmosphere, but still not in outer space, and is capable of zigzagging to a great degree, even making near 90 degree turns. Its exact speed is greatly dependent on the booster missile. For example, there was a 2017 test of a glide vehicle in China, which was observed to glide at an altitude of around 60 kilometers, with initial velocity reaching Mach 10 and average flight velocity being Mach 6. As the glider approaches the target, it will inevitably trade altitude for speed and maneuvers. The DF-17 glider might have similar or somewhat better performance. So by the time THAAD might even reach it horizontally, the glider might be too low for THAAD to be effective against it in the vertical plane. Perhaps even more crucially, THAAD kill vehicle simply isn't meant to maneuver violently. Its thrusters are there to do fine corrections. If the glider makes several near 90 degree turns, THAAD's kill vehicle will likely lose all its speed, continuously using up rocket fuel to try and match continuous maneuvers of the incoming hypersonic glider while the glider should still be fine, having traded all that starting altitude to keep most of its speed. Such gliders are therefore exploiting a gap in current US defenses, where the SM-3 can't engage them at all due to minimum altitude limits, and where THAAD, as implied by US officials, doesn't have a meaningful interception capability either. And while air defense missiles like SM-6 or MSC can't engage them neither until the very last 20 seconds or so, when the glider darts low enough onto its target, and even that would require the interceptor air defense batteries to be very close to targets, which was explained earlier to be unlikely most of the time, save for select high importance sites such as air bases on Guam. Patriot system has additional issues, its radar is not nearly as capable, its limit would not be radar horizon, but lack of power and processing to track hypersonics at more than a few hundred miles. And its MSE missiles, while very fast initially, burn out quickly. Against Mach 6 or so targets, the MSCs may have only a fraction of the useful range they would enjoy against a SCAD type missile, whose terminal velocity is lower. Even if the glider would fly fairly high up, THAAD's horizontal range against such a glider would be several times shorter than against a ballistic missile of similar reach. So even if it could reliably intercept gliders, which doesn't seem to be the case, THAAD would turn into a point defense system, rather than an area defense one. For example, defending both the island of Guam and Saipan against simpler ballistic missiles might be doable with a single THAAD battery, if well positioned. But against high-flying gliders, one battery on each island would be a necessity. Against lower-flying gliders, it might be unusable. THAAD was tested as a prototype in the 1990s. It was further developed in 2000s before it entered limited service in 2008. Last tests were in 2017, as the capabilities were verified against threats such as intermediate-range ballistic missiles. SM-3 was tested in concept in the 1990s and developed mostly in the 2000s. Its production version, Block 1A, reached initial service in 2006. The bottom line is this, all those BMD systems were designed in the past for previous threats, 
when hypersonics did not even seem plausible as a threat to the US. The SM-6 being named as the only possible marginally effective weapon may mean that its two-stage rocket propulsion gives a bigger envelope of interception compared to other terminal interceptor options, such as the Patriot. While marginal, that capability is set to improve further with the SM-6 Block 1B. Said variant will profit from the larger motor and will offer greater speeds. Higher speed also means that high up in thin air, the missile steering can be more effective. So even the top altitude figures may become higher. All those are likely reasons why the SM-6 was mentioned as the only plausible option for the US in the near future. But there is another issue for US defenses. The number of missiles procured for all the systems mentioned is quite small. The number of batteries fielded is small. THAAD, for example, is used by seven fire batteries in the US. The reason for that is the enormous price tag of the systems. The missiles themselves, which would ideally be cheap enough to be procured in the high thousands, are way too expensive for that, especially the THAAD and SM-3, specifically designed against ballistic threats. Current production rates are still fairly low, according to DoD budget request documents. And the total number of missiles procured by the US DoD is in the hundreds for most systems. Some of these have likely been fired in tests and training, especially ones like the MSE. It's also worth remembering that anti-ballistic missions and anti-hypersonic missile missions are just a smaller subset of all missions. SM-6 is primarily tasked to down enemy airplanes and conventional anti-ship missiles at long ranges. The Navy is even planning to use it instead of Harpoon anti-ship missiles. Patriot's MSC is tasked to take various enemy aircraft and even large caliber MRL rockets, which Russia and China have in the tens of thousands. It's perhaps not even surprising that for several years now, both THAAD and SM-3 production has been sort of steady. Investing billions into vast inventories of missiles that are already somewhat behind the technological curve may not be prudent. Besides the SM-6 being identified as the least bad near-term terminal defense solution, the US is investing heavily in a new dedicated anti-hypersonic glider system. The GPI program, standing for Glide Phase Intercept, hopes to field a system by late 2020s. It'll be sea-based and would complement the SM-3. Hypersonic missiles are expensive themselves and aren't likely to be fielded by China and especially Russia in large numbers. But if they are nearly untouchable, they could be used against targets such as static ballistic missile defense radars, or even moving Aegis ships. With some of those destroyed, masses of cheaper ballistic missiles could then slip through defenses more easily. By the time GPY missiles get produced in high enough numbers or laser-based terminal defenses become viable, the US may be lagging behind its potential adversaries for some 10 or so years production-wise. Possibly even newer capability hypersonics will be entering service by then too, moving the goalposts further. When it comes to hypersonic missile defense, it seems no one in the world is quite ready for it. Before we go, a quick reminder to download and play Crossout by clicking the link below the video. The game is free, it's fun and you'll get a free bonus. The unique pixel paint, a choice between a selection of three weapons and a powerful vehicle guy. Try it out! And remember, Binkov may talk about hypothetical wars, but only real peace can bring us all together.